After a five-year war, a truce was declared and Saddam Hussein considered other targets. He invaded the fantastically wealthy and minuscule Muslim kingdom to his south, Kuwait, and had to be driven out by the largest military force that had ever been assembled by mankind up to that time. Unfortunately, due to political considerations, Baghdad was not invaded and Saddam Hussein was left in control to begin a war of genocide against the native Iraqi population of Kurds with little or no interference from the American troops or aircraft. A short ten years later, when his second attempt at his dream of regional domination failed with the abortive terrorist nuclear attack on Tel Aviv with a stolen Russian nuclear device, he was spared again. The American president managed to convince Israel not to retaliate in kind. The muzzles and leashes that had restrained the Mossad and the CIA were loosed and a program of selective assassination of Iraqi leaders by every means possible was ordered. When Iranian intelligence was politely asked, through the helpful auspices of the French Sarit, if they wished to assist in their enemy's destruction, they agreed enthusiastically. The Iranian moles in the Iraqi government were smuggled high-technology weapons from the secret laboratories of both the CIA and the Mossad. Even the Russian government was asked to lend a hand to destroy the madman who had threatened a world nuclear conflict. While it is not known who the Russian moles were, or how the weapons were sent to them or who their targets were, the effects of one of the world's largest intelligence bureaus produced results almost immediately. Hundreds of ranking bureaucrats that had not been on the American-Israeli-Iranian list expired within two days of the request to Russian intelligence from suspicious causes. The last of the high-flying K-12 surveillance satellites saw hundreds of cars moving under cover of darkness with their infrared television cameras during the Night of Vengeance, as the Israelis termed it. American analysts theorized that the Iraqi military had been thoroughly suborned during the period when Russian officers were stationed in Iraq as tactical and strategic instructors. The targeted destruction of the brains of the Iraqi government was not one of the oft-thumb-fingered exploits of the old KGB, but an operation conducted by the professional assassins of Russian military intelligence known as GRU or the Aquarium by its initiates. Short-term biological agents, radioactive tantalum poisoned, BB-sized pellets shot from air rifles disguised as umbrellas, finely dispersed cyanide aerosols, neurological toxins derived from marine animals, and mercury-filled dum-dums were favorite techniques as was beheading at a 10-meter ranges with entrenching tools by the unknown assassins of the GRU. The Mossad and CIA used either small bombs made with a form of stabilized nitroplastic explosive known as plastique made by a factory in Czechoslovakia or more arcane techniques which were never discovered by the poorly trained and equipped Iraqi coroners. Within days the beleaguered dictator found that his generals and staff were decimated and the ranking members of his bureaucracy had been nearly annihilated. Once the infrastructure that had protected him was gone, Saddam Hussein knew the game was over. He was forced to flee his country after an Israeli-Iranian-American engineered coup forced him from office to take a permanent vacation in the Sudan with the surviving members of his supporters. Dateline, Sunday, October 5, 2008 Excerpt from a major television news program Anita dropped down into her couch after a long day at the Research Institute. Then she turned on the television before changing the channel to the National Evening News. When the display on the television's CRT cleared, the network anchor Ron Blather turned to the camera and smiled in greeting as he said, Good evening. Tonight's lead story concerns the worldest weather. All over the world vast areas are either being burned to a crisp or washed away by torrents of water coming down from the hills as rainfall patterns change. In the mountains of Peru, El Nino Grande, as the locals call it, has caused unceasing rainfall for the past month as rain is diverted from the Pacific Ocean to the hillsides of the mountainous region. The infrastructure of the country has been devastated. Bridges and roads have been washed out all over the countryside, isolating most rural areas from government aid. People in the drought-affected areas are concerned about future water resources, and rightly so. As water levels drop in the deep wells and reservoirs dry up under the relentless sun, citizens are becoming concerned that potable water may become scarce. Local governments are trying to convert to surface water sources, but they are often contaminated or overused. 
we asked ourselves, is the situation as bad as it looks? A report from Jerry Trinkwasser investigates their problem in detail.